Okay, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for um, your presence in our lives. And the time that we can spend together in studying your word and understanding the truths for this time. We just pray, Lord, that you can work upon our hearts, that you can bring a conviction and a power in our lives that we have not experienced before. We pray for our family and friends, those that we have contact with, that we can be an influence for good. And we ask, Lord, that you can reveal to us our need of you. Help us, Lord, as we look at this topic, the symbolic use of numbers, that we can understand this correctly and that we can see that you are leading and in control of the things that happen in this world. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in this study on the symbolic use of numbers, we have, we're going to draw your attention to some non-Adventist material. And we're going to look at some similarities in what people do with some of the symbols that we have, and particularly the number 273. So we had this discussion before, looking at the number 273. uh, We know that this was brought into the movement by uh, Tess through her studies on Acts chapter 27. But she wasn't the first one to notice some of these things regarding the number 273. And so we're going to look at uh, this guy, uh, Miles Wiley Albright, or Albright, he's uh, a rancher and a pastor, I guess, he says he is. He was ordained by Morningstar Ministries under Rick Joyner. Now, people, do you know who Rick Joyner is? Anybody know who he is? Sounds familiar to me. It's, it's familiar to me. I, I, I'm trying to remember if he was connected to the Vineyard um, movement. But um, I know I've run into that name, so I just I, I should have looked it up exactly his history. But anyway, it's not Adventist. Um, and he went to the airport and vineyard revival in Toronto, Ontario, in late March of 1995. Now, I remember that in the 1990s because it was a huge issue and there was lots of discussion uh, about some of this spiritualistic uh, stuff that were happening. Um, I knew some Adventists who actually joined the Vineyard Movement, and uh, I'm pretty sure Rick Joyner had something to do with the, the Vineyard Movement. But anyway, so what we're looking at is somebody who's not an Adventist, but has seen some of the symbols that we've seen. And, and the reason we're looking at this is that there is there is a way in which um, numbers can be misused and misapplied, and we see it in this movement all the time. Uh, I saw some of it happening um, even before July 18th. Uh, people weren't understanding the significance of numbers. And even after July 18th, and there's still people who keep, you know, taking spans of time and trying to, you know, set dates and so forth. And the fact that people who aren't Adventists notice some of these numbers uh, doesn't mean that these things, that these numbers are incorrect. But their use of these numbers is something Uh, that we would have, like, the conclusions that they draw. Just because you have a number doesn't mean the conclusion that you draw from some number is correct. So what's the basis of understanding truth? Is it numbers? Why why do we have numbers in the first place? It's waymarks. Okay, well, okay, well, there's waymarks. But we have the plain reading of God's word, right? We are to understand God's word in its simple and straightforward language. That is, we know we can't take numbers and symbols and get them to contradict something that's plainly taught in Scripture. Now, there are people that God is leading who don't fully understand Scripture. We don't fully understand Scripture, right? There's many things we don't understand. And and so God has these numbers there as a witness to truths in his word, but they aren't the truths themselves, if that makes sense, right? To understand that 273 is the symbol in scripture, it has to be applied correctly, right? So we have not, we've not based any doctrine upon the understanding of the symbolic use of numbers, right? All of the prophecies that we have, the repeats of history, all of these are based upon an understanding of prophecy that has unfolded over time. But people will take some of these symbols and misuse them. 
Now, sometimes God is trying to speak to those individuals through these symbols. Sometimes those those symbols are being misused basically because Satan is behind it. So Satan can misuse numbers, right? Just because somebody has a number and says this number is a symbol, if it contradicts the plain reading of God's word, the conclusions that that person draws from those numbers, we would have to disregard their use of that number, correct? Mm, Yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at what this guy says. And and we'll see that there are some things that are very similar uh, to what we have as far as how he uses numbers. So he's going to first start with uh, the book of numbers. So he had gone to this um, vineyard revival thing. He was kind of, I guess, it didn't really work out the way that he wanted. And so he just sat down and started studying the Bible. And he started dealing with the book of numbers. And he started looking at the numbering of the tribes of Israel. And we've looked at that in detail um, in our study as, as we were going through the book of 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 judges and so forth and looking at at, and and not judges but um just judges but joshua and looking at the numbering of the tribes in the book of numbers and you know so he says here um strangely each tribe's count came out very even this is the middle paragraph there the 12 were then totaled then in a slightly different fashion there was a separate count of the 13th tribe levi by name so what he's going to really talk about here is there's going to be the firstborn of the children of Israel that are going to be counted. And then you're going to have uh, all of the Levites from a month old and upward, all the males. Right. And, and we looked at this last last week. Right. And, and he's going to notice that there's this there's all these even numbers. And then you have this odd number, twenty two thousand two hundred and seventy three. And and then the difference between the 22,000, and we know it's actually 22,300, but they take 300 off. And then they do the math to get this 273, that they then have to redeem these 273 firstborn Israelites who exceeded the number of the Levites. And, and that's going to be 1,635 shekels because five shekels each. So we looked at that. So then he says, I looked up at the ceiling and said out loud, Lord, what does the 273 thing mean? And he silently spoke to me for the first time in a long time. He said, this is the number of the church. The Jew and the Gentile joined together in the one new man. The 153 great fish of John 21, 11 are symbolic of the Gentile nations being harvested at the end of the age And the 120 Jews in the following chapter is the church. Added together, they are 273, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Now, did God speak to him and tell him this? Now, he says God spoke to him silently and told him this. Do we believe that God told him this? Well, when I heard it, I thought it was coming from another source. Okay. So, now... Sometimes when a person is recounting what they experienced, you know, he may not be saying, this is what I heard, you know, silently in my head. He's, that's what he's saying he said he heard. But it, it, it may be a shortcut of, of the conclusions that he came to. It may have been from his study. He obviously would have known about the 153 great fish of John 21, 11 already. He would know of the 120 Jews in the following chapter. Acts chapter one, right? And so we can say, you know, he had an impression and he brought these things together in his mind. Now he's going to attribute it that the Lord spoke to him silently for the first time in a long time. But we don't know that he actually, God actually spoke to him. Now God may have been trying to speak to him. That is true. But a lot of this stuff here is not, is not really according to scripture. Some of it is kind of, but some of it isn't. What what would be the problem with what he's saying here? Uh, the Jew and Gentile joined together in one new man. What, what's he talking about there? What what is the basis of his 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 theology here? Anybody know? We we always look at the two sticks. Two sticks. Uh, okay, that's what we look at. <laughs> Can you see that he's a dispensationalist? Yeah, see that. So, so I'm familiar with the language of dispensationalism and, and what he's talking about is dispensationalism. So he does believe, you know, that the Jews have a part in Bible prophecy, as you will see, right? 
um, in our time. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that an Adventist would say. So, so there are things there that, that would definitely not agree with what we understand to be the truth. Okay. So then he says, I was dumbstruck. I said, thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad I asked. Okay. So whether, you know, how that actually came to him, this revelation, you know, it's his account. And people aren't always, wouldn't say that they're dishonest, but, but they have to give the account in some way in which, you know, it, it makes sense. And there's probably a lot, lot more to the story of how he came to that conclusion. So, you know, so he explained it at church, right? And they, they said, well, what does it mean? Right. But, so he says his his response evolved over the next few weeks. So he's going to take some time. Now, of course, a lot of this stuff is he's giving us a shorthand account of it. It's like if I tried to explain stuff that we came to understand, there's going to be lots of details missed out. But he's going to say what happened um, is that on November 11th, 1995, uh, we were confronted with a strange fact. Three different men, Charles Payne, Jr., Rogers, Hallbrooks, and myself, had each previously had some prophetic experiences that had something in common. Charles had a vision, and Roger and I had dreams in which we had seen dramas played out at real places beside three different actual highways, namely Interstate 65 um, and State Highway 69 and U.S. Highway 231. The subjects of the dreams and visions have to do with the church, and this is not too remarkable. But what stunned us was that when we traveled to the actual real-life sites on the three highways, they were all beside the same mile marker, you guessed it, uh, 273. So I actually went on Google Earth, and I found these sites where the mile markers are um, that he's talking about. And uh, Charles and Rogers had happened before the April 1995 revelation. And uh, mine had happened in the fall of 1995, though I never thought to go to the actual site. till Charles and I stumbled on it on November 11th, 1995. What's more, when we got out the state map and plotted the three points, they formed a straight line. Now, I actually tried that and they don't form a straight line. You know, unless unless, you know, his locations that he gave me are pretty approximate, but they don't appear to to be a straight line. Now, it's easy to have two points making a straight line. If you took three random points and you actually had a straight line, uh, it's not very likely to have occurred. Now, I guess I should probably bring this up uh, for people to see, but uh, I'll do that in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to get this. Just going to get that set up while I'm doing this. Okay. <clears throat> so the line begins at Birmingham and ends near Guntersville. It is generally north and, and south, though it leans about 27 degrees and 30 minutes. Now, he probably did this on a paper map back in 1995 um, that might have distorted uh, the line itself for him because, you know, paper maps are not exactly correct, but... You know, no map is. Google Earth is definitely much better because it will draw the line in a straight line. So three other prophetic experiences followed this that are too lengthy and complex for the scope of this story. So there's going to be three other points that are going to be found, and they're going to form across across North Alabama. And then it says later we came to realize that it leans because it is the disciples' cross and is to be carried on at an ongoing basis as opposed to the cross of Christ, which is a finished work. So I'm not really sure what that means. And then he's going to go through some some more things in February 1st, 1997. They're going to uh, look at 273 degrees of longitude or longitude, however you pronounce it. Um, that is, if you go from zero and you go east and you come around 273 degrees, uh, you're going to the 273rd degree is going to be. 80, between 86 and 87 degrees west longitude, right? Now, the Parthenon lies in that. So that's something I noticed before. Now, they're talking about Alabama, but where they have, Nashville is directly north of this area, right? So Nashville is directly north of this area in Alabama that this cross marks. And they're saying that this cross doesn't touch either edge of those uh 
that. So it fits within that 273rd degree uh, longitude. And then he's going to have an unusual counter at this time. And, and he was shown that the tribe of Levi is never numbered with the rest of Israel in a grand total. They were considered a nation apart and yet within greater nation Israel. And he showed me that the Levites were the servants of the priests. The priests, direct descendants of Aaron, were, of course, also part of the tribe of Levi. But the regular non-priest Levites were there to serve the ones who were, were priests. The Levites toted wood, built fires and slaughtered animals, etc. This facilitated the works of the priests who actually went into the presence of God. Right. Now, we also know the Nephilim are involved in the stuff that happens outside of the sanctuary as laborers. Uh, he doesn't mention the Nephilim here. Um, but he, he starts to notice this priests and Levites aspect, right? So then he's going to find this in Acts chapter 27. So he's first going to find the 273 in Numbers chapter 3. And then he's going to be looking at Acts 27. And he's going to, he says, well, I'll just read what he says. It's kind of funny in a way. Uh, then I got a definite impression to turn and read Acts chapter 27. I read it, even though it's not one of my favorites. It's the rather lengthy story of Paul's trip to Rome in an ill-fated ship. Now, I'm not sure why he doesn't like that story. I think it's a fantastically written story. But anyway, then I saw something I'd never noticed before. For some reason, Luke suddenly inserts into his narrative the number of souls on board. To my dismay, it was 276. I thought, Lord, why didn't you knock off three? of those guys. This is so close. And then he spoke to me again, read it again. And then I saw that Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus got on the boat in the first verses. Then I saw it. These guys were in fivefold ministry. They were the New Testament Levites. And Levites are not numbered with Israel. Strange as this may sound, I believe the Lord said, really, there are 273 plus three people on board. Is it coincidence that Paul had accompanied Paul and company are allowed to temporarily leave the ship in Acts 27, verse 3, leaving 273 persons on board. So he notices a few details, like in Acts 7, verse 3, they leave the ship. And so there is 273 persons on board, assuming that those are the same people on the ship the whole time. Uh, we don't know that that's the case. But but he then gets this 273, 3 thing from that. So the 273 plus 3 which is kind of interesting. So he says, in one session, the whole thing from the definition of Levites to the separation of the Levites, census-wise, to the definition of the New Testament Levites, to now go read Acts 27 and the 276 I found in it. It was quite a moment, but only later would I begin to recognize its significance. On July 13th, 1996, Charles Payne was baptizing someone beside our church building in a stock tank we use for such purposes. The tank was beside the power meter on the back wall of the church. During the ceremony, Charles Payne looked up and saw that the permanent customer number our local co-op had affixed to our building six years previously was 2733. The feeling of being foreordained for such a time as this was overwhelming to say the least. Now, this would remind us of the 187 on the birdhouses that Odilio saw when he went out to pray. Uh, when uh, him and Stephen and John Mark were called to before the tribunal, uh, you know, being asked to recant of their belief in July 18, 2020. And and we have all had similar experiences like this. Now, so we, we look at some of these things that, that he's presenting. So some of it is based upon scripture. Right. So he's got scriptures there. But it seems that most of what he is uh, experiencing has to do more with personal experience and, and revelation outside of scripture, like people having dreams or a vision and these different locations. I mean, can God work in this way? Can God use visions and dreams to show us things that are in scripture? Yes, he can. And God. But we also know that these things can happen that aren't necessarily from God. And we don't know in this case, is God trying to speak to them and teach them something, maybe preparing them for receiving truth later on, or, or is this the, a work of another power? And we don't know because we don't know these persons personally. We don't know their heart. We don't know what God has been doing in their lives other than what they tell us. 
Now he's going to say on the first anniversary of the 273 revelation, on the 4th of April, 1996, the Lord said he was going to give me three birthday gifts. Two are not the kind of thing I can share, but one is relevant to my overall storyline. He told me that my birthday was the 273rd day from the end of the year. I counted it up, and of course he was right. And when I asked why it was not the 273rd day from the beginning of the year, he told me that leap year would mess it up every fourth year. Now, now of course, I don't know if that really makes much sense to me personally, because even if it's the 273rd year, three out of four years, it, it would be a cardinal count of 273, one out of four years, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Just because of February 29th. So if you counted from, you know, I mean, obviously it's it's from the end of the year and there's nothing wrong with looking at the end of the year um, and doing a count as well. But, you know, to me, that doesn't seem to be like a very good reason. So I'm not sure that God would say that to him, but, you know, I can't I can't be certain. OK, so his so from the the day that he's he's born, um, it's going to be uh, 273 days to the end of the year. So that, that's one of his birthday gifts that he's, he's going to get. Uh, then on the 30th of June, 1998, while at an early morning prayer meeting, the Lord spoke a large word to me that took me an hour to comprehend. He said that the day before my wife and I were married, I was approximately six months older than she. However, the day we became one flesh, we became the same age. She having become about three months older and I three months younger, spiritually speaking. He then asked me what our average age was the day we got married, for that was our true age spiritually on that day. So I sat down and soon figured out that it had been 27 years, seven months, that I had been 27 years, seven months, uh, two weeks and zero days old on our wedding day. And Barbara was 26 years, 11 months, and four weeks old and zero days old on that day. Our average age on our wedding day was 27 years, three months, and three weeks and zero days. I was totally astonished, dumbfounded, and for once speechless. I recovered from the third but the first two prevail till this day. So, and then he says, which is a good thing. I mean, he says, it's hard for me to write this because, you know, it's so much about my personal life, me, my marriage, my church, my state, right? And 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 that would be true even in the things that, that we have found, you know, Stephen Jameson's birthday, my, my birthday, you know, different things. Uh, Kelly, what day were you disfellowshipped? I know you probably got to run to your, to, to unmute yourself, but I, I think it was July 7th, 2013. Is that correct? You can correct me if you're listening. <clears throat> you know, so, so we all have different uh, events in our lives that we can connect to symbols. July 7th being uh, an interesting symbol that's going to show up in this study. Now he's going to talk here about some uh, insights with regard to 273. I need to find this again. So this is another thing. Now, now he's going to mention a couple, but I'm going to mention a few more. So I've just got to change screens here. I'm not going to get through this whole thing, I don't think. So uh, these are things about 273 that occur um, as coincidences. Now, I don't know. Uh, 27.32 is the freezing point of water on the Kelvin scale. I don't know. Does that make sense to anybody? No. It doesn't make sense to me at all. I don't think that's correct. Absolute zero is 27, 273.2 degrees Celsius, right? So I know that's true. I, but I've, I've seen people say that, and I, I don't think it's true about 27.32. 273 days in the average human pregnancy, um, the average human menstrual cycle is 27.3 days. Minus 273 degrees Celsius is the temperature of absolute zero. And that means the absolute zero point of water now is cooler than the temperature it takes to boil. That makes no sense. That would be freezing. So I'm not sure what they're doing here, but I've seen some of these things, same things repeated on other sites. Gases expand by uh, one to 273 of the volume with every degree on the Celsius centigrade scale. 
Um, I don't know if that's true. Uh, water changes phases at 273 degrees Kelvin. Uh, the triple point of water takes place at 273.16. Um, so some of these things I'm not quite sure of. Comparing the square's per perimeter to a circle having an equal circumference, the circle's diameter is 27.3% longer than the edge of the square. That is true. And if you draw a circle inside a square with the circle's diameter the same as the square's length, the area left over that the circle does not cover is 27.32% of the total area of the square. Now, these ones are interesting. So the ratio of the Earth's diameter to the moon is 0.273. So the ratio of the Earth's diameter to the moon's diameter. So the moon's diameter is, uh, I guess, 27% uh, of the Earth's diameter, 27.3%. The ratio of the moon's diameter to the Earth is 3.66. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that is correct. Oh, I see. Because it's adding 32 degrees Fahrenheit. How does that, that make, that doesn't make sense to me. Because Kelvin is based on Celsius. They're the same. Anyway, okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm, my mind's not working on all these numbers right now. So the ratio of the moon's diameter to the Earth is 3.66. We'll see that later what that means. 27.32 uh, Earth days in a sidereal period of the moon. So that's the sidereal month. And 2,730,000 is the circumference of the sun in miles. Sunspots revolve around the sun's surface in 27.3 days. There are 273 days from the summer solstice to the vernal equinox, that's true. Uh, the Earth and Moon orbital periods are reciprocals. One over 27.32 equals 0 0.0366 for 366 days in a sidereal year. And one divided by 366 equals 0 0.002732 or 27.32 days in one month. Right, that's the sidereal month. Um, 273 meters per second is the acceleration of the sun. I'm not sure what that means. The sun's synodic period is 27.2753 days. So I'm not sure what they mean by the acceleration of the moon in its orbit. So I think that has to do with the acceleration of the curve of the orbit. So anyway, that's dealing with 273. When we, um, so when we, we look at some of these things, I'm just going to go back to the other document. It's just there was more, more, more details than what he brings up in the document. So there's a lot of these significance of 273 in nature. And then, um, so he's going to talk about these. And then he says, after one of our worship sessions, a prophetic country boy named, country boy type named Junior, when you know it, prophesied to Charles Payne that the Lord was saying that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And 273 is embedded in that statement. And you, Charles, are supposed to figure out how. Charles checked the encyclopedia and found that the year is 365.244 days, which it isn't. It's 242 days. Um, that's a solar year. Therefore, you can see that a thousand years was 365 uh, two, four, four days, which divided by one day yields the number, uh, 0 0.00000237. And when Charles brought this to me, he wanted to know the significance of the number seven. So, um, so a thousand years is, uh, 365.242 days, uh, which when divided by one day, so I'm not sure what he's doing. Aran, can you explain what he's trying to do there? So as he's dividing it by one day, how is he doing that? Do you understand? Anybody understand what this guy's doing, how he's coming up with this number? Is he just dividing by 365 or something? I don't, I don't understand. Maybe Try he's to just taking the inverse. The inverse. So how would you do it? If I have like 365,242 days and I'm going to divide it, into one day, what would I be doing? How would I do the math? Because I don't understand it. I didn't understand it before. 
It is one divided by that number, 365242. Okay. So one divided by, okay. Okay, so I see. Yeah, so he's going to get 2.737, well, to to the exponent of six. So I'd have to move over those zeros. Okay, so you get 273. Now, so it's not 2737, though I'm going to use the number that he uses, 365244, which is not correct. One divided by 365244. Yeah, so it's not going to be exactly 2.737. I mean, is it going to be a decimal afterwards? I mean, what you would get is you would get the first three digits is 273. But anyway, he's going to go on and make significance about the number seven because uh, it's the number of the church and the number seven represents perfection. Or 273 is the number of the church. And number seven represents perfection. The 2737 sequence is a prophecy embedded into earth time that the Lord can perfect his church in one day. So, again, some of these things are quite suspect. And he's going to talk about Numbers chapter 10. It tells the sequence in which the tribes of Israel marched through the desert. I drew circles in a row and put the names of the tribes in them. Suddenly I saw the key was the birth order of the original sons. In the middle of the procession of Israelites, as they marched across the desert, Simeon, the second son, was followed by Gad, the seventh son, and you guessed it, Levi, the third son. So the church truly was hidden in Israel from the very beginning. So he draws conclusions from these things. Now, we've looked at a lot of these things ourselves. But every conclusion that we drew was was actually affirming something that we already understood. Now, he may say it's affirming something he already understood. Maybe he understands some of these things in this certain way. Now, it says Paul said he was being poured out as a drink offering. Christ is our atonement and is symbolized by various animal sacrifices. But drink and meal offerings supplemental offerings were poured out on the altar with the sacrificed animal. We, the church, do not atone for sins by our suffering, but we share in his suffering. In Numbers chapter 15, a certain fractional quantity of each of the three kinds of supplemental offerings are poured out on the altar with sacrifice of three beasts, a lamb, a ram, a bull, each animal representing an aspect of Christ himself. Those quantities expressed in decimal fractions are uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.2, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.30, 0 0.50, 0 0.50. So that basically a tenth, a quarter, uh, a fifth, a third. Um, 0.3 would be, I'm not sure how they get 0.3, um, not 0.33. What would 0.3 be as, as a fraction? That would be, I don't know, unless he meant 0.33 and it's just a typo. Anyway, their total is 2.76. So I'm going to just check this here. So so I'm not sure he gets the 0.3. But yes, it would be point uh, uh, 2.76 if the, de de the digits he has there, which represents both the church and the leadership, he says, are supposed to be on the altar of the Lord. So again, he... He interprets these numbers to mean things that I wouldn't interpret them to mean, right? Doesn't mean I'm right or he's wrong, but um, it doesn't really make sense to me. So he's going to have some different things that are going to happen, and I'm not going to go through all of this. But I want to focus on here to sort of close this off. So he says, there is a lot I don't know about God, what God is doing, even in our tiny little corner of the kingdom. But every word I have recorded here is as accurate as I can make it. And most of it is verifiable by examination of the unforgoable evidence or talking to the living witnesses I have cited. On the other hand, I've told less than half of the part of the story that I know about. There is a DVD that describes what happened when God married the 273 three revelation to the blowing of the 300 shofars on 777 at Titan Stadium in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, so this is the part I want to look at now. So I'm taking this as that what what he's what he's doing, whether it's it's 
it's God trying to speak to him or whatever. I don't know. And I don't know if this will. I think this is a PDF. I don't think. No, this works. Okay. Now, in our morning studies, uh, we looked at the shot heard around the world. Now, this is a different shot heard around the world. So what's the shot heard around the world? Around the world. Historically first referred to. Well, the bottle. Okay, Stephen? Yeah, the initial beginning of the... American Revolution. Yeah, so the American Revolution. Yeah. And what, what's the date? April 19th, 1775, you said? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one is we, you know, we have April 19th, uh, which is a symbol of the first day of the first month. Uh, when did the American Civil War begin? Just as an aside. It was April 12th, 1860, correct? So not 1861? 61, yeah, 1861. And um, that date happens to be the first day of the first month on the biblical calendar. So we have symbols for the first day of the first month uh, tied to the start of the American Revolutionary War and the start of the American Civil War, which is which is interesting. But I, I, I found it interesting. This is the title of this article, The Shot Heard Around the World on 777. Now, of course, 777 would mean something to us, right? Because we have the 777 structure. We have the 777 chiasm. It, it's part of our message. And here, this guy is connected to this event that happened on July 7th, 2007. And, and I believe it would have been six years later on July 7th, 2013, that Kelly gets disfellowship, but he still hasn't confirmed that, but I'm just... I think that was the date. So what ended up happening is uh, they decided that they were going to th- blow these trumpets, 300 of them. These, uh, So let me just see. It's going to be this meeting. There's over 70,000 people at this football stage, stadium in Nashville, Tennessee, right? So it's a stadium in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's going to be on July 7th, 2007. So they have some stuff dealing with uh, uh, what what the whole thing was about. So they're going to bo- blow these shofars, the trumpets, like Gideon's army. They have 300 men that reenact Gideon's army to blow these trumpets. And so they, they have things that what these things symbolize, and they believe that this was in a really important event. Now he's going to connect connect this to... It's exactly 40 years after the rebellion of the 1967 hippie movement. And he says, you know, the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, was a hit on uh, July 7th, 67. It was uh, number one on the charts. And some people's personal experience that happened on that day as well. You know, so, so I guess this is some kind of reaction to the hippie movement or something like that that's... You know, these. Um, it's also going to be uh, 40 years that the summer of the uh, of 1967, when Israel retook Jerusalem during the Six Day War. So he's going to connect stuff with literal Israel uh, to this, and says Miles Albright, who was the organizer of the Gideon's 300 men who blew the sh- blue shofars at this event, sent out an email which said Bob Jones prophesied while in Houston, Texas. In 1993, that the Houston Oilers would move to Nashville and build God a stadium in which be would be fired the shot heard around the world. Bob Jones told me on September 30th, the 273rd day of the year, that the sounding of the show first was on 777, was that shot, right? So when you look at these types of things, we can see that it's kind of a mixture of truth and error, Right. And so somebody looking at what we do as a movement can dismiss our material in the same way that, you know, I I guess we would say we're dismissing this material, right? We look at it, we say, well, it doesn't line up with what we understand. And so um, it's just, it's just a bunch of error. Now, is there any way that we could answer this objection based on what we have looked at here. So how would you answer that? You know, other people have used these same numbers and they were just a bunch of nutcases and you guys are no different. How would you answer that? 
It, it's numerology. It's mysticism. And anybody have a, uh, an explanation? Or are we just as deceived as these people? Self-deceived. You know, we, we see coincidences and we think they're significant. What would, what would be our answer to that? Can numbers be misused? Yes. So they, they definitely can be misused. That is, they can't be the basis for our belief. We have to have our belief and understanding of prophecy is, is not just based on numbers. Now, we do have things directly in Scripture that we can show. Obviously, the 273 is from Scripture. This guy notices it. But his application of it and the way in which he comes to his conclusions are not line upon line, precept upon precept. He's taking something from the Bible and mixing it with ideas that are not biblical, right? Everything that we have studied affirms what we already understand as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, to me personally, 273 isn't the most important symbol in Scripture. It is a, a symbol in Scripture. It's, it's something that we can use as a witness. But we, even in this movement, had a lot of speculation regarding 273 about the priests and the Levites and the Nephilims and misapplications of, of Scripture were being done by Tess and Parminder. So, so numbers have been misused within the movement itself. And, and what, what we have sought to do in, in establishing the symbolic use of numbers is that we first look at the main lines of Bible prophecy, at things that are established. So we start with established truths and we understand those truths and their connections with these spans of time, all of these different prophetic periods. So when we go back to when I did the study, I talked about how I first analyzed the prophetic periods that we understood to be truth, that were presented by the Millerites, that are the foundation of Seventh-day Adventism, and began to notice these structures. And the more we looked into these structures, uh, the more that we found. And then after we had these dates, then we could we could confirm that they fit these patterns, but that what was being said about these dates from these patterns would actually show us that that our predictions of the events that were going to occur were wrong. Now, uh, so Stephen has some comments about this, and we're just going to close off here pretty quick with this study. So his comment here is. 777 to 18, uh, July 18, 2020 is 4,600, uh, 4,761 days inclusive or 69 squared. And it's the same numbers as Capricar's constant. Okay. So you counted the number of days from, um, and I'd already done this. So I'm just going to go here. Now, now you did it as an inclusive count, which is interesting. So I didn't do the inclusive count, but the inclusive count is the number from numbers from Capricar's constant, and it's 69 squared. I did it as um, so. Let's look at it this way. So I just counted the cardinal count. The cardinal count is 4,760. Now, one thing interesting about this number. Uh, he talks about the 40 years, remember there, which is interesting. But if we take 40 times 1190, which is, of course, is a symbol that we have, uh, that's going to equal 4,760. Now, Stephen's saying when we go to 4,761, we do the inclusive count, uh, we get 69 squared, right? So, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, in and of itself. And uh, I think there was something else. Um, oh, the other thing is the sum of the divisors of 4,760 is 12960. Um, and that number, you know, the number of days between my birth and uh, um, Dwight's is 1,296 days. But also 12960 is... 
uh, what was the other thing about that number? It is, yeah, so that number is going to be 36 times 360, I think. Yeah, 36 times 360. So, so there, so there are some symbols in there, uh, that, that we have with this span of time between that 777 date. So the question then, you know, that just to sum this up, if we are going to believe in the symbolic use of numbers, we have to use them correctly. That is, we can't just arbitrarily uh, create dates um, and, and use numbers in, in what I would call a superstitious fashion, right? Like we wouldn't avoid, you know, if we're going to the store and we went to buy something and it cost $666, uh, not buy it, right? Or because I know people have done that. Uh, so what is... I guess the question is, what is the true purpose of these numbers? What is Palmoni trying to show us? We can look at 273. We can see it, it exists in nature as, as, as relationships between the sun and the moon and, and the earth, which, of course, relates to time, right? It relates to geometry of circles and squares, relates to temperature, Something which is natural, that is, uh, zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water. 270 minus 273 degrees Kelvin is, is, uh, absolute zero. That is, 273 degrees Kelvin is the freezing point of water. So, so these are, are natural things. We also can relate it to Nashville, taking the 360 degrees longitude and see that 273 degrees goes to to the Pan Parthenon in Nashville. And yet other people have been directed to Nashville as well. Do counterfeit ex counterfeits exist? Could we say that, that that movement is a counterfeit of ours? That these types of things, all this different time setting and things that have gone before are meant to discredit what this movement has done? that they're counterfeits that go before. Does that make sense to people? If there is a counterfeit, is there a genuine? Yes. Yeah. So because counterfeits exist, we know that there is a genuine, and that genuine is based upon God's word. The, the real purpose of this movement is not to just have a bunch of numbers that, that are coincidences, but it's to reveal to us that the foundation of Adventism was laid correctly and that these become witnesses to that but they're not the source of our understanding does that make sense like if i tried to prove the movement to somebody who didn't know the foundation by using all of these coincidences of numbers it's not going to prove anything what is important is the understanding of the prophetic periods that led to Adventism, the understanding of Millerite history, the understanding of the truths of Scripture. Those are the foundation of, of Adventism and the pillars of Adventism. These other witnesses do not create any new truths. They're just witnesses. And they've witnessed to this movement to show that God is leading us in the, our understanding of Millerite history. But they're not to replace the study of God's word in its plain reading. And they can never supersede any plain teaching of scripture. Okay, so uh, any final thoughts before we close in prayer? Kelly, are you there yet? You might have to comment on the video in YouTube. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the, study the studies that we've had today, and this morning on the Sabbath. And we pray for your continued presence in our lives. Help us to follow and serve you. I pray that you can help each of us in our personal walk with you. We know, Lord, that you have given us witnesses in our lives, that you are working in, in many different ways, not just through numbers. Um, and that you speak to us and you comfort us in our trials and that you call uh 
to us to show us our sin and you call us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And so we just ask, Lord, that we can um, continue in the week ahead uh, to learn of you, to learn of the meek and the lowliness of Christ, meekness and lowliness of Christ. And we pray for each person who is searching for truth, that you can guide them and direct them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.